Thank you very much, Janine. And I also want to thank Stephen for this chance to talk about general anesthetics. Uh, my presentation will consist of three parts. First, I'll start with an introduction to anesthesia, the basic of, uh, pharmacology of general anesthetics and how anesthesiologists think. Then I'll, I'll present some functional imaging studies of anesthetic action that are aimed to understanding how anesthetics produce unconsciousness. And these studies will highlight the role of the thalamus. Do you hear me correctly? Okay. And last, I'll conclude with recordings of fast neuronal oscillations in the rat thalamus to explore further the role of the thalamus in anesthetic-induced unconsciousness. Well, it's common knowledge that general anesthesia involves a reversible suppression of consciousness. And therefore, it provides research opportunities for the study of consciousness, whether your primary interest is to understand how general anesthetics work or whether your primary interest is consciousness and you take general anesthesia as another opportunity to look at what happens when consciousness is obliterated. Now, of course, my view on consciousness is, as you undoubtedly all know, is a very complex concept, an entity. Most of what I'm going to talk is about consciousness as a state as opposed to discussing the content of consciousness and the experiential experience. Well, first, a bit of history. Modern anesthesia was really launched in 1846 in Boston by a public demonstration by William Morton, a dentist, circled there, who publicly anesthetized Mr. Abbott for resection of a mass in the neck. And that gave rise to the famous quote, this is no humbug. And if you go to Boston, I'm told, then you can visit the so-called ether dome, the building and the room where this demonstration occurred. Now, how do you define general anesthesia? Well, we'll define it as a, what a general anesthetic is. And it's a drug that produces immobility in response to a noxious stimulus, typically skin incision or other forms of supramaximal uh, pain-inducing event. And it does this other than by mere paralysis of the muscle as curare drugs would do. So these drugs were also found to cause unconsciousness, which I'll define as a sleep-like state combined with unresponsiveness to verbal commands. Of course, the effect must be fully reversible. And there are two major classes of anesthetics based on the route of administration. Intravenous, those given in a vein, and inhaled, those given via face mask into the respiratory system. There are also other drugs that are strictly not general anesthetics because they cannot produce immobility in the presence of a painful stimulus, but they can cause unconsciousness, such as benzodiazepines, dexmedetomidine, about which I'll talk a bit further. Now, anesthetic, the effects of anesthetic drugs critically depends on the concentration. And if you set arbitrarily to one for any given drug, the concentration required to produce immobility in the presence of noxious stimulation, you will find that if you give about 10% of that dose to patients, they will still be awake. They would, of course, respond to pain, but they will be afterwards amnesic for most of what happened. By amnesia, I mean loss of explicit memory. They will not recall most of what happened during the procedure, even though they're awake and conscious. Now, if you go to about point three, you'll find that they are unconscious. And our empirical definition of consciousness is sleep-like state combined with failure to respond to verbal commands. 
Now, these two effects arise from an effects of general anesthetics on the brain, but the immobility to noxious stimulation mainly results from an effect of the anesthetics on the spinal cord. During most of this talk, I will talk about single agent, but just a brief note that in practice, in clinical practice, we use multiple drugs. General anesthetics, opiates, neuromuscular blockers, antiemetics, analgesics, and other drugs to ensure a safe, stable course during the operation and to minimize pain afterwards. And also, the effects of the anesthetics to obliterate consciousness and suppress uh, movement in response to noxious stimulation are very reliable and easy to achieve. But most of our job is to take to prevent and treat the cardiovascular and respiratory side effects of these drugs. But their primary effects are very predictable. Now I'm going to bring you about the MAC concept, which has been of central <coughs> importance in uh, the development of anesthesia. It's a uniform measure of anesthetic potency. So how do you define the MAC? It's the minimum alveolar concentration of inhaled anesthetics at one atmosphere that produces immobility in response to a noxious stimulus in 50% of subjects. And this was introduced by Ted Eager, who was working in San Francisco. Now, min alveolar air is basically the air at the end of our expiration. When you exhale towards the end or the mid-expiration, the air that you exhale was in your lungs, in the long alveoli. Now, why specify one atmosphere is that inhaled anesthetics are gas, gases. And gases are, they're, they're, we talk of percent concentration, but it's really partial pressures we're dealing with. And therefore, it's important to specify that this applies to a one atmosphere. So if we say 1% of concentration of anesthetic agent, it's 1% pressure of one atmosphere. And the interesting thing is that if you wait long enough for equilibration, typically 15, 20 minutes, the partial pressure of the anesthetic in the lungs that you can measure in the expired air is the same as in the brain. So you have a direct measure of the partial pressure at the site of action. Now, how do you measure the MAC? Well, you need to take subjects, either animals or humans. In this case, in this example, based on the review by Sonner, they took mice, and the painful stimulus is a tail clamp. So you take a, a mouse, you expose it to a given concentration of an anesthetic. In this case, it's an inhaled anesthetic called desflurane. And you put it in a box with the 5.5% of atmosphere of desflurane. And then you wait 15, 20 minutes for things to equilibrate, and then you clamp it stale. And here it says probability of non-movement. So if the mouse reacts to the tail uh, clamp, you put a little dot there. And then you, you need quite a few mice, as you can see from the number of dots. You take another mouse, and then you give it maybe 8.5, and this one would not move. So you plot all these data, whether they move or did not move, as a function of the concentration. Once you've obtained these uh, data points, you use some mathematical techniques, typically logistic regression or others, to obtain a continuous probability uh, function curve. And you look at the point where the probability of non-movement would be 0.5, and this, you go down here, and it tells you that in these mice, the MAC of desflurane is 8.5. Now, if you have ever been a patient, you see why we only aim for 50% of subjects. <laughs> Valid point. <laughs> The reason is that the estimate, the, the standard, the, the confidence interval are much wider for the 50% estimate because it's based on more on data before and after. But rest assured, in clinical practice, we have ways to, de to aim for the 95% MAC or even 
So of course, to deal with the MAC, you need to be able to have known and stable concentrations. So for inhaled agents, those that are given via the lungs, it's easy because we have wonderful monitors that give us in real time, like on the monitor screen, the actual concentration inspired and expired. But for intravenous agents, it's not possible because you need biochemical assays that take a few hours, or well, minimum a few hours, but typically it's a few weeks. But we have developed kinetic models of how these drugs are distributed in the body that are not only predictive, that, don't, that do not only allow you to predict what would be the concentration for a given dose, but also allows you to control delivery and we have some infusion systems, we call them target control infusion pumps, that allow you to key in the concentration that you want in the blood of that patient, and they're accurate to 10 and 15%. And therefore, you can do the MAC equivalent for IV agents, we call it effective concentration 50. But it's the same as for inhaled agent, except that the measure, we do not actually measure the concentration because it's only done offline. Now, consciousness is not about moving when someone uh, inflicts a painful stimulus on you. It's about responsiveness to commands, at least for anesthesiologists. So from the MAC concept, evolve the MAC awake concept. And what's the MAC awake concept? It's just response to simple verbal commands. And the simplest commands is open your eyes. We find it's the one that patients do, the, the, that's the easiest for a patient to do. If they don't open their eyes, they won't do anything else. And also it's very convenient because we stand at the head of the patient, the patient's right there, we can see their eyes. Now this is a crude, a simple but extremely reliable assessment method. These are data for determination of the MAC or EC50 or CP50 for two anesthetics, propofol and IV agents, and desflurane and inhaled agent. This is the anesthetic concentration in microgram per mil of plasma or blood for propofol and in percent atmosphere for desflurane and it's just by chance that they happen to, ha to be in the same range, uh, numerically. And you'll notice that the, f the point at where 50% of volunteers don't move here for desflurane is about 2.5, 3.4, and for propofol, if you go down the midpoint, it's 2.7, right? Remember this, 2.7. Other study from another lab from Europe, the previous one are from the States, Similar subjects, MAC awake or EC50 awake for propofol concentration, what's the EC50? 2.7. So even though responsiveness to command is a very simple and some consider crude and primitive method, it is extremely reliable. As you can see, the, the inter-institution differences for MAC awake is of usually of the order of less than 10%. The importance of this measure led us to develop some standardized method and validated method, and this is the one that's been most often used, the observer assessments of alertness scale, alertness and sedation scale, which goes from five from fully alert subjects, like I hope you all are, Two subjects who are lethargic and respond slowly to their name, but they respond slowly, or who respond only after their name is called loudly or repeatedly, which is a three. And some subjects will respond only after they've been mildly shaken on the shoulder, or some even will not respond to that and they will get a one. We consider someone is unconscious if they are less than three. And by repeated forceful verbal command, it says, sir, open your eyes, open your eyes, sir, or madam, please open your eyes now. <laughs> if they don't do it, then we consider the unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it works. <laughs> 
Anesthesiologists, we're like the old sailors in the time of that wind was only powering ships. We have a very good empirical knowledge of what the phenomenon of consciousness is. We can predict when subjects will regain consciousness. Like, for example, sometimes we'll see, start to see facial movements. We know if the patient that is waking up starts moving their face, grimacing, within 10, 15 seconds, they'll be able to respond to come in. So our empirical knowledge is pretty good. Our basic scientific knowledge is another issue. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to talk about functional imaging to understand the functional imaging. So of course, how do general anesthetics work and how do they produce consciousness is a complex, very difficult question. And uh, function, when functional imaging became available, it, it provided a wonderful opportunity to look at that. So the first studies were done by al qaeda in 95, and they looked at the propofol anesthesia in six subjects, PET imaging with FDG, which gives you a direct measure of cellular metabolism. And they found that general anesthetic reduces metabolism uh, in the cortex and subcortical areas, more so in the cortex, but did not find any regional differences. Two years later, they did the same thing with isofluorine, an inhaled anesthetic, and they found a similar thing, a fairly profound reduction in brain metabolism against uniform across the brain. The same year, uh, Veselis and his group did, for the first time, use blood flow measures using a water label that with oxygen-15, uh, midazolam is not, strictly speaking, a general anesthetic, but if you give enough of it, patients will become unconscious. And they're the first, to my knowledge, to have reported that there's a global reduction in cerebral blood flow, but there are also areas that appear to be more affected than others, such as the thalamus and the posterior uh, part of the brain. We have a problem. Why is this freezing? <laughs> He's unconscious. <laughs> that thing seemed to be really frozen. Okay, that will unfreeze it. So at that time, I'm just recovering from the shock. At that time, we decided <laughs> to uh, use a, a different approach whereby we would, uh, instead of using just comparisons between awake and anesthetized, we said, why don't we look at different concentrations of we chose propofol and, and blood flow studies, but we said, why don't we look at different concentrations of propofol such that it would produce uh, light sedation, just nicely relax, moderate sedation, a bit somnolent, none of you is, and unconscious, unresponsive to verbal commands. And the plan was to look at areas of the brain whose blood flow would be reduced proportionally to the drug concentration. And this is what uh, we observed with my, was a, were a group, our uh, colleague, my colleague Pierre Fizet was the first author, and what we found was that the thalamus, again, and the post midline occipital parietal area were the areas really where the uh, blood flow was significantly reduced as a function of propofol concentration. These are, this is a T-map showing significance uh, of the, the correlations, and this is corrected for multiple comparisons. Also, the orbitofrontal appear to be involved in this uh, pa uh, paper. These findings have been replicated uh, a lot. For example, KAISTI in 2002 did a somewhat similar study, except that they just did a simple comparison awake versus anesthetize. With propofol, you see the similarity of the effects is quite remarkable. Sivofluorine, similar findings again, uh, for at least for the propofol, 
and the occipital parietal midline area. And there's been over 10 papers, I, I would uh, guess, that consistently revealed these findings. Now, how do you interpret these very reliable findings is a difficult issue. First, you have to make assumptions that flow metabolism coupling is preserved in the presence of general anesthetics. I don't want to go into the details of this rather complex question, but in the case of propofol, it is certainly preserved. In the case of sevoflurane, it is almost certainly preserved since the, as long as the concentrations used are reasonably low, as was the case for the uh, KIST and other studies. So we can assume that flow metabolism coupling assumption are intact and that therefore the blood flow changes we see reflect changes in neuronal activity. So what we see is probably a true reflection of what happens in the brain. Now, some of these alterations may reflect events that cause consciousness, but there is no proof. And a, a, a simple analogy for this is when, there's a, when it rains in a big city, you still hear me in the phone is down. <laughs> when it rains in a large city, you'll see umbrellas popping up on the street and windshield wipers working. An outside observer would conclude that, or maybe God saying, every time I send rain there, I produce windshield wiper movements and umbrellas popping up. So if you take the analogy, propofol is the rain, Umbrellas popping up is a loss of consciousness, and the blood flow changes are the windshield wipers. But the windshield wipers are, the changes in the windshield wipers and the umbrellas are completely unrelated functionally. They just both depend on the presence of, pro, of the rain, but there's no causal relationship between the two. Some people seem to be lost. Is my example clear or not? Yeah, okay. It's even worse than that. Some of these alterations may be the consequence of losing consciousness. And that applies particularly to the parietal occipital midline area. Amir in the previous talk talked about the resting network. Well, the cuneus precuneus area, the midline and the parietal occipital area, is one area known to be heavily engaged in daydreaming and mind wandering. And perhaps the changes we see has nothing to do with causing unconsciousness. It's just you lose consciousness and you stop mind wandering. In an attempt to, uh, how am I doing about for time? 15 minutes left? Oh, even better. In an attempt to establish a stronger link between the observed behavior, uh, behavioral changes and blood flow changes, we decided to take advantage of a drug called physostigmine, which is an inhibitor of the acetylcholinesterase in the brain, and in, it increases acetylcholine in the brain. It's somewhat similar to a recept that is used for symptomatic treatment of Alzheimer's dementia. We found that if you give physostigmine to human subjects, anesthetized with a steady concentration of propofol, uh, they wake up. They open their eyes and they can follow simple commands. And we have recorded their electroculogram to prove it. This is from a single subject. You see during baseline, you tell the subject, open your eyes, and the subject open their eyes. And you see here as it produces a, a deflection of the electroculogram. Now, if you anesthetize the subject with propofol and give them normal saline, well, they just keep not, they just keep not doing the, what you ask them to do. But if you give them physostigmine after 5-10 minutes, they'll start responding to command. Of course, it takes them a bit longer, about almost a second and a half, and their eye opening is less brisk, but they do open their eyes. They can even count. <laughs> 
So by all, by, by definition, they have regained consciousness, even though the concentration of propofol in the brain is the same. So our design was we decided to use uh, uh, human volunteers. So we obtained here a blood flow PET scans during baseline, two scans just in case one is would yield, uh, would be problematic uh, with artifacts. Then we increase propofol slowly until they become unconscious. How do I define unconscious? Failure to respond to repeated verbal commands. Then we obtain scans during unconsciousness. Then we give the physostigmine, an initial bolus and an infusion. We obtain scans after they've regained consciousness. And we obtain scans during recovery just to be thorough. Well, this was not an easy study to do. We recruited 11 subjects. Well, three didn't wake up with physostigmine. Happens. The good thing is they all yielded good imaging data. <laughs> Eight regained consciousness, four of which yielded good imaging data, and four could not yield data because they were just moving too much. And those of you f uh, familiar with functional imaging, it requires a minimum of immobility to be able to acquire the data. And some of the subjects were just, they were awake, responding, but you tell them, stay still, they do it for 30 seconds, and then they start scratching their nose, and uh, so we couldn't get data. So we get a final sample of seven subjects, three non-responders uh, non and four responders. And these are the results, which were uh, recently published, and the main uh, worker for this was Guo Ming Si, who was doing a PhD, who was a PhD student. So this is for the responders, and this is the difference between baseline and anesthesia. This is a T-map uh, showing the statistical significance of the comparison. And again, it shows that during baseline, blood flow is higher in the thalamus, and again in the two culprits, uh, cuneus, precuneus area. If you give physostigmine, those who woke up, you see the thalamus is becoming like Rudolph's red nose. It's really a highly significant increase in thalamic blood flow, as, as, as well as the, uh, in the cuneus, precuneus area. And if you do a conjunction of these two data maps to find the voxels that were significantly, that showed a significant increase for both contrasts, you find the thalamus and the precuneus. If you look carefully, you'll find out that the, uh, the, this is just at the border of the fissure that separates the parietal from the occipital lobe. So the cuneus is not involved, it's really the precuneus. The non-responders showed similar uh, findings during baseline anesthesia contrast, higher blood flow in the thalamus and cuneus precuneus but no activation of the thalamus after physostigmine and no return of consciousness. So we concluded from this that these changes affecting the thalamus and the precuneus appear to be really to have something to do with the level of consciousness. It's still not possible to say whether it's the cause or the consequence, but at least this, this establishes a stronger relationship a functional relationship between the two. We think that given the known role of the thalamus in uh, arousal and maintenance of consciousness and the remarkably highly significant increase, we think that probably this is the activation of the thalamus contributed to the return of blood to, of consciousness. For the cuneus, uh, we don't know. It might be simply the consequence of <coughs> regaining consciousness and being able to engage as some form of mental imagery. But also, this area has been shown to be uh, implicated in general awareness. A group, al Kair and uh, collaborators from uh, Finland, in a recent paper, use a somewhat similar approach using an anesthetic called dexmedetomidine. In fact, it's not an anesthetic, it's a sedative, rather, which is a selective alpha-2 agonist. And apparently, I've never used this drug, but you can awake someone uh, 
during a constant infusion, just like we use with physostigmine, but just by shaking them, you shake them a bit, and then they become able to respond to command for a few minutes. And they use a complex multivariate analysis technique to identify the brain and the voxels that correlated with the level of consciousness. And these are their findings. You see the design score contrasts the, the return of consciousness compared with the periods when the subject was unconscious before or after. And what they found is that the, the brain areas that correlated with the presence of consciousness, again, the thalamus, no, not much involvement of this area, but uh, involvement of the thalamus, brain stem, and uh, anterior cingulate uh, gyrus. So I don't want to discuss the, the, this new finding, but I'm just going to focus on the fact that once again, the thalamus appears to be implicated. Now, of course, these measures of blood flow, as Amir indicated, provide an indirect measure of neuronal activity that depends on intact blood flow couplings. Now, if when we introduce general anesthetics, it's probably okay, but with physostigmine and uh, possibly dexmedetomidine, we don't know whether the intact coupling remains. And therefore, we wanted to use another marker of thalamic function to confirm that, uh, to confirm that the thalamus is indeed involved. How am I doing for time? Ten minutes? Ah, oh, we're perfect. So Amir mentioned that uh, gamma and high gamma oscillations uh, provide, uh, uh, are, are, provide similar information as those of, of, uh, recorded with blood flow changes with fMRI or PET or fMRI. Uh, this provides a review and a specific paper uh, on which uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Singer, who is a co-author of this, shows that hemodynamic signals correlate tightly with synchronized gamma oscillations. And when you read that paper, you find that the, the, what they found most useful is that power in the 50 to 200 hertz range. So we decided this time to uh, use uh, rat, rats to record local field potentials, which is essentially the EEG recorded with small electrodes for all practical purposes. So we recorded local field potentials with implanted, with electrodes implanted chronically in the barrel cortex and thalamus VPM of rats. We chose the VPM because it's an easily accessible and important nucleus. We chose the barrel cortex because it's the cortex that uh, receives projections from the VPM. Some of you will say, why didn't you choose the precuneus? Well, there's no precuneus in the rat. If there would have been one, we would gladly gone to it. There is no posterior cingulate, there's no precuneus. I think there's an anterior cingulate, but that we did this before the recent paper of, uh, um, that I showed uh, showing the anterior cingulate activation. So the, the rats are first anesthetized. We implant these electrodes. We also implant a jugular catheter for drug administration. We give them a week to recover. And then we do exactly the same thing as we did with our human subjects. So we obtain baseline recordings. We start propofol with TCI. You can use target control infusion in rats just as in humans. You increase slowly the propofol concentration until they become unconscious. Then you give the physostigmine. They wake up or react in some way. We record, and then we obtain some recovery recordings. Well, they didn't wake up as well as humans, uh, probably because they need more propofol to be anesthetized. But in any case, they showed some clear responses to physostigmine. I should say that how do you define, I, I forgot to say, how do you define that a rat is unconscious? Open your eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they keep their, their eyes are open when they sleep. So <laughs> uh, it's the writing reflex. In animals, we use the writing reflex. You take the animal, you put it on the side, and you look at two things. Does it get back on its paw? Is he trying to get back on his paw? Or can he do it? Our criterion for this was 
no attempt to write itself. So you put the animal on the side, it just stays on the side. And then you put it on the other side, and it stays on the other side. So he's really asleep. So no rat was it really able to get back on its paws. But there were some spontaneous limb, limb movements and some writing ap attempts. Timid attempts, maybe, but some writing attempts. Spontaneous whisking. Uh, whiskers were moving. And an orienting response, some uh, animals showed an orienting response to gentle touch of the snout. And these changes were sufficient that we could score them uh, with a standardized form as we did the experiment. So some showed uh, only spontaneous movements with just a bit of whisking, some showed everything, so we have a different range of responses. In regard to the power of uh, gamma, high gamma oscillations, power in the 500 to 200 hertz. We'll just focus on the thalamus here. So from baseline to proper fall, there was a significant decrease. Each thin line represents one of the 10 animals, and the thick line is the median. And there was, a, when we give a, the physostigmine, then there was a significant increase. Uh, and a further increase during recovery. So power increased significantly after the injection of physostigmine. And these p-values are done with uh, Wilcoxon match pair tests, and it's corrected for multiple comparisons. So the 0 0.048 is a real 0 0.048. Yeah, we did correct for multiple comparisons. Furthermore, the intensity of the arousal response and the intensity of the increase in gamma power were correlated. So here you have the arousal response rank. We rank the animals on no, that would be no arousal response to a superb arousal response. And we calculated here the increase in gamma power. And you see that these are the individual data points and there's a significant uh, correlation between the two that's significant at point 0087. And we have two representative animals. Animal number two, who showed a great behavioral response with orienting to the snout and even trying to bite the little Q-tips that uh, we were touching his snout with. You see this is the thalamus power. This is anesthetized condition power and in the anesthetized condition from 50 to 200 hertz, and red is physostigmine. means you see it w there was a clear increase in the power in this. Rat number four was less cooperative, showed a minimal response, and you see here there was a minimal, even no a clear increase. So we concluded from this that the thalamus really appears to be functionally related to the restoration or consciousness or the lightening of anesthesia with physostigmine because we don't not only have human imaging data in humans, but also we have animal data with local field potentials that provide a confirmatory evidence that there's an increase in thalamic function with physosting mean, and that this increase is correlated with the intensity of the behavioral arousal. So in conclusions, I hope that I've improved your knowledge of anesthesia and what it can do for the study of consciousness and how anesthesiologists think. Please, when you read literature using anesthesia, pay attention to the methods for drug administration and for the evaluation of consciousness. And I find that the evaluation of consciousness is often not specified enough. They say a failure to respond to verbal command, but they don't say how, how are repeated, uh, how, much in, in, how much insistence was placed, was, how, was it confirmed. So this is critical because sometimes you'll have subjects that will respond after you start yelling at them. Uh, well, we do it for their own good, of course. But. <laughs> anesthetic, and I also I hope I convince you that anesthetic induced unconsciousness involves thalamic dysfunction. All the work that I've presented, of course, I didn't do it this all alone. Uh, this is my group of uh, colleagues and students. Those with the asterisks are those that did most of the work, graduate students or fellows. <laughs> 
So this is for the imaging part that I presented. Mrs. Zuliet is our research nurse coordinator who uh, keeps us all on time and makes sure that we can test in a safe and organized manner. And these are the, uh, Sean is the stu uh, master student who did the work with the uh, rats and collaborators. Thank you. Um, 